Hey, Algebra 2 Honor students, this is going to be Functions Day 5. This is not in your packet, so you're going to need some paper to take some quick notes by hand today. We're going to go a little bit further with what we're doing with inverses here. So yesterday's lesson was all about finding inverses of functions, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this concept today by analyzing the inverse of f of x equals x squared plus 1. So hopefully we understand that to find the inverse of this function, we're going to start by saying y equals x squared plus 1, and then we need to switch x and y and solve for y again. So we get x equals y squared plus 1. Once I do that, we're going to go ahead and solve for y by subtracting 1 to the other side. And then finally, hopefully you're all shouting out at the same time, take the square root of both sides. But this actually came up in class recently that if you take the square root of both sides, you can't forget that we have plus or minus the square root of x minus 1. So that would be the equation for the inverse. Now what's interesting about this is that if you were to graph this, x squared plus 1, maybe you remember that x squared is a parabola and it gets shifted up one unit because of the plus 1. If you were to reflect that over the line y equals x, you wind up getting what looks like a sideways parabola. So this is f of x, and this relation is the inverse. Now notice how I very carefully said this relation is the inverse. The plus or minus gives you the top half and the bottom half of this graph. So what do we know about the inverse of y equals x squared plus 1? We know that the inverse is not a function. OK, so that's going to be a pretty important concept. So if we said find the inverse of x squared plus 1, it actually technically doesn't have an inverse because the inverse doesn't wind up being a function. And therefore, we know that f of x is not 1 to 1. OK, because that's what we talked about in the inverse lesson, that if something's 1 to 1, that means its inverse is also a function. How can we tell, looking at the original graph of f of x, that this wouldn't be 1 to 1? Well, remember, for it to be 1 to 1, every input needs to have a unique output. That's what makes it a function. But every output has to have a unique input. And take a look at this output right here has two different inputs, right? So I'm going to say one more thing, that f of x fails what we call the horizontal line test. I'm going to abbreviate it as HLT. When something fails the horizontal line test, that means that the inverse is not a function, and therefore it is not one-to-one. -one. Well, I guess what we can do, though, is could we have made it such that we can find an inverse that exists for x squared plus 1? So could we restrict the domain of f of x? such that the inverse is a function? And the answer is, well, I guess I wouldn't ask this question if, there, if it wasn't possible, right? But can we restrict the domain? Can we cut up that graph somehow along the x-axis such that the inverse would be a function? Let's go back up to that picture, that rough sketch a second ago. Can you guys imagine that if you really just took like either half of the parabola, that it would pass the horizontal line test? So let's choose the easier side, in my opinion. Let's actually go ahead and take a look at the side where x is greater than or equal to 0. If I said consider f of x equals x squared plus 1, but only on the interval that x is greater than or equal to 0, then we get just that half of the parabola. So if I were to sketch this, it's going to be shifted up one unit, but you're just going to get that side when x is greater than or equal to 0. So what would the inverse be? Well, you're still going to go through and you're going to solve and get that radical x minus 1. But it only makes sense to consider the positive end of that radical because x is greater than or equal to 0. So we're going to get that this is the square root of x minus 1, not plus or minus anymore. And what that inverse looks like is, let's just use a different color here. OK, now the inverse is, in fact, a function. And remember, you could think of this line y equals x as that reflection line. So if you sometimes cut up a function that doesn't have an inverse and restrict its domain, you can then find the inverse 
that would exist that corresponds with it. Okay, kind of a tougher concept, but this is certainly something that you might come across in pre-calc honors and then calculus beyond that sometimes we might wanna restrict the domain to make this happen. Let's go on to another example of finding an inverse. If I gave you g of x is equal to x minus one over x plus five. So this will also be a pretty different example for us. We haven't seen one yet where there's multiple x values in the function. So we have x is on the top of the fraction, x is on the bottom. So in order to find the inverse, we know that we'd start by saying y equals x minus one over x plus five. But when I switch x and y, you have to make sure that you replace both x's on the other side with, with y's. And there's gonna be a trick to this one that we're gonna use in other examples. So we'll, we'll try and remember this trick later on. But as long as you switch x and the y's to start, I kind of like putting this over one and thinking of it as cross multiplying. But our goal, remember, is to solve for y, to get y alone, which will be a little bit more challenging because we have y's in two locations. Let's go ahead and take this x and distribute it into the y plus five. So I'm gonna say it's xy plus five x is equal to, on the other side, y minus one. Okay, at this stage, I'm gonna do a little bit of rearranging. This is kind of the critical stage. We wanna solve for y. So at this stage, you need to group the y's together on one side. How am I going to do that? Well, I actually will add this one to this side and keep it with five x. And I'm gonna subtract x, y to this side and keep it with that y. So we're gonna do just a little bit of rearranging here. That result's gonna look like this, five x minus one. Hold on, plus one, that looks better. And then on this side, we had y, and I'm subtracting the xy to this side. I want you to think about why do I wanna get those y's together on one side before I give you the answer? So what is the answer to that question? Well, the y's are gonna be nicely grouped together because if I put them all on one side, you can now take out y as a GCF. And that's the most important step. Okay, if you have multiple y's, get them all together on the same side. Anything without y is on the other. Take out y as a GCF and then divide in the last step that quantity one minus x to the other side. So in the end, you get that y equals five x plus one over one minus x. And if you wanna go back to using inverse notation, we would get this is the inverse function. So definitely a little bit more complicated algebraically to find the inverse here, but you'll see similar examples to this. So don't forget to refer back to this example in the notes if you need to. All right, the next part of the lesson here is gonna be talking a little bit about restricted domains. And we have this, we've had this discussion already as it relates to certain types of functions, okay? I'm just finding the top of the paper here. Oh, it looks, we're getting close. All right, so we're gonna talk about restricted domain. And for restricted domain, meaning there's values that I can't plug in for X, there's really three cases. So I wanna review those cases and then you're gonna get some practice with them on a page in your packet. So the first case is if you have a rational function. And what does the rational function essentially amount to? It's going to be something in a fractional form. Okay, so if I gave you, for example, f of x equals one over x, where we have a variable in the denominator. We know that we can plug in anything for x, except we don't wanna plug in zero, because that's gonna make this undefined. So therefore the domain of this would be negative infinity to zero, union zero to infinity. So in general, how do we figure out the domain of a rational function, set the denominator equal to zero, solve, and then exclude those from the domain. Okay, when I set the bottom equal to zero, I mean here there's not a lot to do, but whatever those value or values plural are, we wanna make sure we exclude them. When would I get more than one answer to setting the bottom equal to zero? Um, I don't know, if there's an x squared-ish term down there, you might get more than one answer. All right, moving on to number two. We also have issues if we have 
a radical function. So we'll start with kind of the most basic case. If we have f of x equals the square root of x, what do we do with radicals? Well, we can't take the square root of something that is negative. So what we look at always for a radical function is the quantity that's under the radical. And we have to set it to be greater than or equal to zero. Whatever that quantity is, whether it's x, if it was 3x minus 7, I would have set 3x minus 7 to be greater than or equal to zero. Okay, if you like interval notation, which I think will be the directions later on, that would look like zero to infinity with a bracket at zero. So in general, what's the rule here? Set the quantity under your radical to be greater than or equal to zero. Okay, because you really want to ensure that whatever you're taking the square root of is zero or something that's positive. And finally, what's the third case? I'm going to call it the combo, the rad frac. Okay, if you have both cases at once, something unique happens here. So what we're talking about is if I have f of x equals 1 over the square root of x. Okay, so not only do we have a fraction, but we have a radical in the denominator of that fraction. Well, I'll tell you in this scenario that whatever this number is down here has to be greater than zero, which doesn't look all that different than what we had up above, except here we could also be equal to zero. So why can't I be equal to zero for the combo? Because it's in the bottom of a fraction. The square root of zero would be zero and one over zero is undefined. So it's a minor detail that we have to pay attention to. But if you have a radical in the denominator, we have to take that quantity and set it to be strictly greater than zero. We can include it because it's in the denominator. So here's what that domain looks like in interval notation. And again, in general, set the quantity under the radical to just be greater than zero. Okay, not greater than or equal to, just greater. All right, so those are the main cases. And I really said that I've really only done the simplest of cases, but I think that you should have the skills to, if you have a fraction, set the bottom equal to zero and solve. It's just solving an equation. But then once you get your solutions, make sure you exclude those values from the domain. Similarly, for an inequality, just don't forget that if you're dividing by a negative when solving an inequality, it flips that sign. I'm sure that might come up at some point. Similarly, for down here, make sure you're separating the cases between when you set it to be greater than zero versus greater than or equal to zero. So what are you going to do at this point? Well, at this point in the game, if you look in your packet on page 31, page 31 says functions day five domain practice. So go to page 31. And you're going to do the practice there. I believe there's 16 questions. And you find the domain only. We don't care about range for now. All right, find the domain on those. So what's going to happen is the next time I see you in class, I'm going to have you break up into some socially distant groups or maybe even some groups in our Google Meet, and you're going to go ahead and go through the practice with some partners. Okay, so you're going to talk these out, see if you get the same domains, different domains, and if you have any discrepancies, you'll talk about those and then let me know. All right? So we'll go over these questions in class, but I do want you to take the time to do them on your own so that you can talk about them in a small group. If you have any questions in the meantime, let me know. But remember, it's only a restricted domain if it falls into one of these three cases, rational, radical, the combo. If it's not one of these three cases, what's the domain? All real numbers. All right, so that's it for today. I will see you next time for some domain practice recap.